Hi, New Hope. My name's Elizabeth. We're really missing you guys. We can't wait to get church together. We love you. Bye. 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 From five sevens of our family. Hello, we're the Bowers. And we really miss our New Hope family and can't wait to see you again. Hi, New Hope Church. We're the Pancos. I'm Brandon. I'm Casey. I'm Lainey. I'm Weston. We can't wait to be back in church soon. Miss you, Mr. Ryan and Miss Allison. Miss you, Mr. S Mr. Standard. Miss Donna. See you all soon. Bye. 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 Good, Good morning, morning, New Hope. We're, We're the Ruples. I'm Paula. I'm Brooke. And I'm Frank. And this is Keely and Taco. They're really hot right now. Brooke just got back from a walk with them. But anyway, we just wanted to say we really miss everybody. And um, we're just praying we can get back together real soon in church and see y'all. Uh, but until then, just we want to wish you a great summer. Bye. Bye. See you real soon. Well, hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for Church at Home. Now, I've got a few important things I wanna let you in on the inside scoop. Um, if you've tuned in these last few weeks, you know that a couple weeks back, uh, we decided to move from sheltering in place to gathering in place. Now, this decision came out of a lot of time spent in prayer, discerning what God's will is for our church, especially during this season. In a big way we felt like the Lord was calling us to gather differently during this time was through the formation of small gatherings in homes we call watch parties. Now, if you haven't heard, watch parties are where you invite your friends, your family, your neighbors into your homes to watch church at home together. And we're so excited about all of the multiple watch parties that are already starting to take place throughout our neighborhoods. We believe that God is going to do some incredible things through these gatherings, reinforcing and reminding us of the important truth that the, the church isn't something you just go to or you do, it's something we are, anywhere we gather in the name of Jesus. Even once we restart our Sunday morning gatherings, watch parties are going to continue to play a critical part in helping people connect with each other who may not be able to attend at our campuses for a while. Now, if you're hosting a watch party, we would love to hear about it. Let us know about it uh, because we wanna be able to pray for you and we also wanna be able to celebrate that gathering. Now, if you're not hosting or you don't know of one to join, let us know so that we can help you find one. You can do both of these things if you go to uh, the site watchparties.cc. Now, we know that there have been a lot of rapidly developing changes in the last couple weeks when it comes to guidelines for large gatherings, especially churches. And no sooner do we digest a new piece of information that something else comes along shaping the situation even further. It can be hard to make any kind of long-term plans with things constantly changing. And like we said, when we announced this season of gathering in place, we're closely following all of the changes happening as churches of all sizes are working to restart their Sunday morning gatherings as quickly and as safely and as responsibly as possible. And we know that with every update, many of you are asking the question, well, when are we gonna start gathering again on Sunday mornings? And we get that. We, we get that in a big way and we can't wait for the day to come when we do get to gather again in person as New Hope Church at our different campuses. Now, here is where we need your prayers. Now, as we promised, we're about to enter into a re-enter into a time of discernment this week to seek further guidance from the Holy Spirit on what and how and when regathering in large groups might restart. And as we continue to gain clarity on when that will be and what it will look like, we're gonna keep you all posted through email, on social media, and of course, at Church at Home. And until we have clarity around that, we are so excited and expectant that God is going to continue to move in powerful ways through our watch parties. So please pray and consider hosting a watch party or join someone else's. Again, you can learn more about what this might uh, look like at Watch Parties CC. Now, there is one more thing that we want to share and we're so excited about sharing this. While we may not yet have a date, 
for returning to our normal Sunday morning gatherings yet, we do have another date that we think you'll find pretty important. So I wanna encourage you to mark your calendars for next Sunday, June 14th at 7 p.m. because we're gonna be gathering in person on campus for the first time since March 8th for a night of worship on the lawn. You see, with all the craziness going on in our nation with racial tensions and wounds, as well as you know our community itself going through just a tough time of isolation because of COVID-19, coming together in unity is more important than ever. And as we're figuring out what it looks like to return to our large gatherings on Sunday morning, we wanted to give an opportunity to safely gather together for a time of worship and prayer and taking communion together outside of our Effingham campus. So load up your lawn chairs, bring the entire family, and meet us on the lawn for what's sure to be an incredible evening with your New Hope family. And please know that we'll be taking all the precautions possible to keep everyone safe and healthy. And of course, as always, if you don't feel com comfortable coming to this event, don't feel any, any pressure to attend. And of course, in the event of rain or inclement weather, we'll announce a new date. But we're so excited to continue church at home and the watch parties forming in our neighborhoods and now coming up, worship on the lawn. So we hope to see you there and we hope you enjoy the rest of the service.
Thank you so much for joining us today for Church at Home. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we are so thankful that you're choosing to spend part of your weekend here with us. And we wanna hear from you. Fill out a Connect card by tapping the link in this video's description, or you can find it and fill it out on the New Hope app. This weekend, we are continuing with our series, Prove It. And for each week of the series, we're introducing a new Prove It challenge that we want you and your family to participate in. This week's challenge is the whipped cream toss. Here's how it works. Just film you, your kids, or the entire family attempt to toss whipped cream and catch it in your mouth. Then email that clip to us at proveit at newhopechurch.cc or you can tag us in it or DM it to us on Facebook or Instagram and be sure to share your failed attempts as well. Then we'll show some of our favorites next week during Church at Home. We're also sharing weekly devotionals for all eight weeks of the series that are available to download at newhopechurch.cc slash proveit. Be sure to check back every week for the next week's devotional. And we wanna thank you for continuing to worship through the faithful giving of your tithes and offering. It's because of your continued generosity that we are able to reach even more people in our communities with the love of Jesus. You can give by tapping the link in this video's description, by mail, or through the New Hope app. And if you need help in any specific way, be sure to let us know by visiting the homepage of our website. Thanks for being here for Church at Home and enjoy the rest of the service. Whenever I was growing up as a kid, I absolutely loved the time change. Daylight savings time. Like, I loved it that, like, in the winter, it would get dark by dinner time, so the Christmas lights would, you know, turn on as early as possible. And then, of course, I also loved it on the opposite end, where in the summer, you know, it would stay light out till almost 9 o'clock at night, so I could stay out and play with my friends for as long as possible. See, the changing of the clocks was a way of changing, you know, t to tell the changing of the seasons for me. It was a natural ebb and flow of the year. But of course, now that I'm a parent and have kids of my own, I hate daylight savings time. Like anytime my wife tells me like, hey, you know, we're changing the clocks this weekend. Like I immediately go into this like cold sweat and, you know, I'm fighting off panic and we're like going into like Lindsay and I go into a week long period of prayer and fasting because we just know, you know, starting that Saturday night, they're going to want to get up too early or stay up too late or they're going to be crabby and they're going to, you know, get at each other and it's just going to take way too long for them to adjust to the new normal. See, growing up, I always wonder, why did my parents hate the time change so much? And now I know, me, I'm the reason. See, our bodies and our minds, they take a while to adjust to the new reality of even an hour's change in time. This is why jet lag is such a big deal for those of you who fly and travel quite often. You know what I'm talking about. It's crazy how, like, because I did a little bit of a deep dive on time zones and how you know, we developed time zones and things like that. And of course, I learned that time zones were not even invented until 1883. It wasn't really a thing until the inception of the railroad. See, the railroad companies, they ended up pushing to have America divided into four time zones. Because until then, we never traveled fast enough for us to be able, you know, for it, for it to ever matter. And that was only about 100 years before I was born. Prior to that, every town and every city kind of kept their own time in sync with a, you know, local 
clock tower or church or anything like that. And, you know, of course, now we can travel to the other side of the world in less than a day. And that big shift, you know, messes with our natural bodily rhythms. In fact, I remember one of the times I experienced jet lag, you know, in the most severe way was I did a missions trip to China. Actually, this would have been back in 2002. And, of course, we drove up to uh, Chicago flew out to LA and then from LA flew over to Guangzhou, it's the third largest city in China. And I remember we spent most of the day driving up and then flew out to LA. And I remember we were flying out to China that evening. So like I'm watching at LAX, watching the sun, you know, set. And of course, as we're getting into the plane and flying off, you see the sun on the horizon and the, you know, Pacific Ocean, very, very beautiful. And I'm like, okay, like we'll be flying while it's nighttime. I'm going to go ahead and sleep and you know, get some rest and we'll be ready for a new day. Well, after a 13 hour flight in the morning, I'm waking up I'm like, okay, we're almost there. And I lift up the little shutter thing and I see the sun on the horizon. And I'm like, oh man, like the, the sun is so beautiful. And then I see it set again. See, apparently, which I guess I don't know why I didn't think of that, we were following the sun as we were going westward. So I had to experience 24 hours of night my first day in China. And of course, it was the opposite on the way back where we're kind of going against the sun, so the day goes much much more quickly, so it's almost like 24 hours of day. You know, it took a while for us to get back to normal, to get synced with the normal schedule again. And so whether you love the time change or you hate it with a passion like I do, I just want to welcome everyone who is watching with us as we are continuing in this series, this eight-week-long series we're doing in the Gospel of John called Prove It, as we cover the eight key signs that John records Jesus doing to prove to all of his readers, whether they were Jew or Gentile, that he actually was the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior that the world had been waiting for. And so uh, as we've been doing this series, we've actually had been developing a devotional, a weekly devotional that you can, uh, you know, kind of take part in. So uh, if you want to follow along, we, we release a new one each week, kind of connected to uh, that week. So if you go to newhopechurch.cc slash prove it, you can have access to that devotional. It's been really cool the first couple weeks, so I encourage you to check it out. But today, I want to tell you a story that focuses on the third sign Jesus showed to the world about who he was. See, in this story, Jesus ends up healing a guy, much like last week. But here's the interesting thing, is that the story isn't really about the healing. It's about something deeper. And this is always the way Jesus' miracles were. These, they were called signs for a reason, because a sign does what? It points to something else. See, these wonders and signs Jesus would do actually were pointing to something more significant, something deeper, richer, more hopeful than just the sign itself. And, of course, these signs weren't always received well. And as we'll find out today, this sign in many ways happened on the wrong day, and it unfortunately happened to the wrong person as well. So if you would turn with me to John chapter 5, uh, we'll see the beginning of the story right here. So sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there was in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored colonnade, covered colonnades. Uh, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. Now, the setup of this story is incredibly important, and we're going to continue to get key information as the story goes on, but it starts out with the setting, that there is this pool near a gate called the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. That the, the pool is called the Pool of Bethesda. Then the story, it takes this turn where uh, we find out that this pool is always surrounded by disabled people, the lame, the blind, the paralyzed, 
And you may have noticed if you're like looking in your physical Bible as you're reading this story along with us, you may have noticed that there's even a footnote in the bottom that apparently years later, centuries later, a scholar or somebody added in a added in an extra part to the story, trying to describe about this story. And uh, so essentially, uh, the Bethesda pool apparently was known for the water stirring from time to time. And the people at the time believed that an angel of the Lord would come and stir the waters. And whoever got in the pool first, once the water started stirring, would be healed. So that seems like a good place you would want to hang out if you had some sort of physical ailment or disability because you wait for the water to start to stir up, you get in, and you would be healed. But here's the thing about that. We don't know if that rumor actually really happened because in the story, Jesus doesn't really discount it. He doesn't really confirm or deny whether it's true. But of course, from the description at the beginning of the story, clearly the pool's healing effects weren't that effective because it says that a large number of disabled still lie there. So either the rush of the waters didn't work, you know, the healing power of the water didn't work, or it didn't happen that often. But it says that Jesus learned for this particular story, one of the paralyzed men that was there, he found out he had been like that for 38 years. And I had always kind of wondered when I read that part, it said he found out that the man had been there that long. And I always wondered, how? How did he find out? Now, maybe possibly he knew by the power of the Spirit, kind of in a prophetic way, he knew that the man had been there. But there's a part of me, honestly, that likes the idea, and this is just my conjecture, that he actually asked around. That Jesus cared enough about this guy that felt led by the Spirit to do a little investigation. And so he began to ask some of the other people there, how long has that man been, been there? to seek out the information about him. And then Jesus asks him a question that honestly, really, in some ways, God asks all of us, or at least in a form of it, do you want to get well? And it's interesting because this question, or at least a form of this question, is the most often asked question that Jesus asks in the Gospels. Do you want to get well? Or maybe a more general version of it would be, What do you want me to do for you? Jesus constantly asked that people, you know, would ask that of people. Essentially what he's asking them is, what do you want? He asks everybody that. What do you want? See, that's a question of desire. And the thing that I have learned over the course of my own spiritual life in many ways is that desire is the fuel of the spiritual life. Desire is the thing that propels us forward to seek after God because it's hard for us to not trust God or have faith in things we don't care about. See, desire is about the parent who desperately wants to see their child healed and cries out to God night and day for God to heal them. It's the man who desires for his marriage to be saved, to, for God to restore it, so he is continually seeking after God to honor God with his marriage. It's the teenager who desires to live a life of significance and so begins to pursue against the grain of maybe what their friends say rather than going with the flow, doing what their friends say, you know, his friends friends say is popular or accepted. This person, this kid, this girl goes the way of Jesus because they want to live a life of significance. See, God created us with all sorts of desires, social desires, physical desires, emotional desires, and these desires are the, are the fuel that propel us to seek change and to cry out to God and to find solutions. Desire is the fuel for all of that. But of course, oftentimes in our lives, we often live disconnected from our desires. Like the man in the story, we, we don't know what we want We don't even understand our own motivations. When Jesus asks the man if he wants to get well, how does he respond? He makes excuses. Well, I don't have anybody to help me out of the pool. Someone always gets in there first. See, when he says that, he's not even really answering Jesus' question. He's stuck in this victim mentality where he's so caught up in this cycle of try, fail, try, fail, try, fail, that he doesn't recognize the fulfillment of all of his desires is literally standing right in front of him. 
And of course, empty religion does this to us. There are formulas, spiritual formulas, spiritual traditions we put forth. You have to do things this way or that way. And oftentimes, you know, or you're not accepted. And it traps us in a cycle of striving and trying. And we lose sight of what really matters. And the truth is, you were not built for that. I was not built for that. We were built to desire God desire all of the good things that he offers us, and we were designed to have him fulfill those desires himself. Our desires propel, you know, propel us to him. In fact, this is why in the Westminster Catechism, the first question asked in this kind of set of, you know, teachings that were used to disciple, you know, children in that day and even today, the first question that it asks is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer it gives is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's why you were created, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And so that's what this third sign is pointing to. In a world of muddled and confused and broken desire, Jesus has come to redeem and restore all of them. See, in this story, it was meant to show us that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of our desires. I was reading in a commentary about this passage, and it mentioned that the pool, you know, this pool of Bethesda, you know, that is in Jerusalem proper, uh, it's just north of the Temple Mount, that it was actually just a few, you know, just a small number of years ago, was actually excavated by archaeologists. And you can actually go see the pool of Bethesda today. But what was most interesting about it is that they realized as they began excavating is that that area was not just regarded as a sacred site to Jewish people and Christians, but it was actually regarded by pagans as a sacred site as well. There was evidence they found among the archaeological dig that suggested that at one point that pool had been dedicated to Asclepius, the god of healing. So John's audience, likely both Jewish and Gentile, see in the story Jesus is literally fulfilling the hopes and desires of all the people, Jew and Gentile. In fact, there's, a, there's an old hymn some of you may grew up singing uh, called Desire of Every Nation. See, this third sign seems to be pointing to this idea that Jesus is genuinely the desire of all nations. And this idea comes from the prophet Haggai. Uh, he referred to this in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. The prophet wrote, This is what the Lord Almighty says, In a little while I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. See, this is what the prophet had been talking about, this moment where Jesus is showing up. Jesus, the desire of nations, had come. And he's shaking things up. He's destroying religious formulas. He's fulfilling the deepest desires of the human heart. And sadly enough, like I mentioned, this whole new thing Jesus was doing, it came apparently on the wrong day and sadly enough, came to the wrong person. Continuing in John 5 and verse 9, it says this, The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? And the, man, and the man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, sadly enough, many scholars and commentators that I've looked at and in, in teachings I've heard around this actually indicate and speculate that the man that is healed in this story in John 5 actually lacked genuine faith. 
Because in most healing stories, in most stories where Jesus performs a miracle or heals someone, typically there's a mention of the person's faith, um, you know, or there's something, some sort of exclamation of thanksgiving or a begging of the person to be able to, you know, f- begin to follow after Jesus. But in this story instead, all we see is it riddled with excuses. Do you want to get well? But I can't get into the pool. They say it's the Sabbath. You can't carry your mat. But the man who healed me told me to. Well, who was this man? I don't know. He left. He got away before I could find out who he was. I mean, does anyone else find it strange that this man in this story who was healed after being crippled for almost 40 years, all he can do is make excuses? He's been set free from a debilitating condition, and yet when trouble comes his way, rather than focusing on the healing, you know, you'd think you might be a little excited like uh, religious leaders. Do you notice how I haven't been walking for 40 years and suddenly I can? Instead, he's focusing on, but none of this is my fault. It's his fault. It's that person's fault. It's not my fault I can't get in the water. Now, the truth is, I get excuses. I really do. Because I hear them all the time. Being a parent to two five-year-olds requires that you get used to hearing excuses. Every time one of them starts crying or yelling, which is almost on a daily basis, I have to become like a detective for the NYPD trying to work the case to figure out what actually happened. Because, you know, it's never my fault. It's always the other person. You know, Lissy hit me. Well, why'd you hit her? She called me stupid. Why'd you call her stupid? Well, she wasn't, she said she wasn't my friend. Well, why'd you say that? Well, she took my toy. Well, why'd you take her toy? Because she looked at me. Oh, insufferable world that you would look at your sister. I think I figured out and cracked the case. It turns out you're both five and overdramatic. Case closed. Chalk one up to Detective Sturkey. But of course, in this story, we see a man, a grown man, making excuses. Nothing is his fault. He can't help it. He can't get into the water. The random healer is the one who told him to get up and walk with his mat. How is he supposed to know who the guy was? Why in the world would you ask the name of the person who healed you, after all? Excuse after excuse after excuse. Nothing was his fault. It just happened to him. He was the victim. I see, at the end of the story, Jesus shows up again, and he warns the man. He says, stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. I always thought that was a really interesting thing, why Jesus would say that. And of course, I'm thinking, wait, is he warning that, you know, if he doesn't stop, like, he's almost like indicating that the man was crippled because he was sinning, and if he keeps doing whatever he was doing, that he's going to, experience something even worse than being crippled? But I don't think so. Because we know, and as we're going to see in a few weeks, Jesus heals a man who was born blind, and he actually puts that idea to rest that, you know, things that have, you know, hard things like that, like diseases and debilitating things, don't necessarily happen because I did this one wrong thing, so God punished me with a disease or with a disability. Like, that's not how God works. Jesus, in a few chapters, in a few weeks, as we're going to say, is going to make that abundantly clear. So why the warning? Why would Jesus circle back and give this kind of cryptic warning to this man he just healed who doesn't seem to believe in him, who doesn't seem to be very thankful at all or appreciate what had been done for him? Why would would he do that? Well, I think the beginning of John's gospel has pointed to it from the start. If you've been reading along with John with us, maybe you have been, you know, reading the gospel chapter by chapter. Maybe you've been following along in the devotionals with us. Um, but in John 1.14, it says this, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Then a little bit before that, uh, verses 9 through 12, uh, it says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You see, Jesus was starting this new thing in the world 
ushering in this new kingdom, and this new kingdom was breaking formulas, was shattering traditions. It was going against the grain of the ways of the religious. This is why the Pharisees were rubbed the wrong way with him so much, because he was ushering in this whole new way of living, this whole new way of existing. And for those who were willing to believe, for those who were willing to begin to walk and exist and live in this new kingdom, in many ways, it was like beginning to live in a new time zone. With a new time zone, at times when you feel like you should be sleeping, you're actually supposed to be awake. But see, the Pharisees, they didn't want to wake up. They didn't want to let go of their tightly held control and all of the power and the influence they had gained because in their circumstance, it hurt to be awake. And so this language of waking up, almost living in a new reality, was used often in the early Christian writings. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, So then, let us not be like others, who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation is a helmet. In fact, uh, Paul would later write to the Ephesian church what was considered to be one of the earliest kind of Christian hymns memorized by the church. It says this in Ephesians 5. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. And Christ will shine on you. See, what Paul was saying to the churches and what Jesus was trying to convey to this man that he had healed, who seemed to not understand what had actually happened, he was letting them know when he was warning this man, stop sinning or something may worse may happen to you, he was letting this man know a new day has dawned. The old ways are passing away. We are entering into a new world and it is time to wake up. We're in a whole new time zone, guys. The time zone of eternity. And you're going to feel, when you begin to live in this new time zone, in this new world, you're going to feel a little bit out of step with the world around you because they are still asleep and you are now awake. And what's sad about this story is that we actually don't know what happens to this man. In verse 15, it says that he goes to tell the Jewish leaders that it was, in fact, Jesus who healed him. But it's honestly a little bit cryptic why he did it. You almost have to wonder, was he giving glory to God, letting people know, like, oh, Jesus changed my life. Jesus healed me, and I just wanted everybody to know. Or was he tattling on Jesus? Because, again, he had been grilled by the religious leaders, and he's like, what are, you, what are you looking at me for? I didn't do it. I don't know who the guy was. And now, and once he found out who it was, maybe he's going to tell him, like, hey, just so you know that it wasn't me that was doing this. It was Jesus. It was this other guy who's been stirring up a lot of problems that he was, you know, kind of telling on Jesus to get off the hook. See, Unfortunately, I fear that may be the case for this man because never does the man th thank Jesus like so many others did. Never does he leap for joy or beg to follow Jesus wherever he would go. Instead, he makes excuses over and over and over again. And it seemed like the only thing he desired was to get himself out of trouble. In the end, it seemed that the man preferred to stay asleep rather than to wake up to what God was doing through his son, Jesus. And so a conversation occurs right after this healing. And I want to highlight one thing that Jesus says in it, because I feel like it's really pertinent uh, for where we're at right now. In John 5, verse 16, it said, So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. See, in this third of eight signs that are coming up, once again, Jesus performs a miracle that wasn't really about the miracle itself, but was pointing to something more significant. What it was pointing to was the reality that the time to wake up had come. 
that God was at work, that God is at work in your life to this very day. And it turns out that all of your desires, all of these things that are propelling you forward in life are actually pointing you at something. But that something is not a something, it's a someone, Jesus. He is the one you've been waiting for. And it turns out he's been working in your life this entire time. We are all sitting at our own pools of Bethesda, waiting and watching for the fulfillment of our desires, having no idea that we're waiting on empty promises because the things we're waiting on are myths and legends that can't deliver. We don't realize it, but the only one who can make us well is actually standing right in front of us if we would just wake up. Jesus, the desire of nations. Like John said in chapter 1, verse 12, it says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. See, the truth is, many of you have been searching. You've been looking, searching for significance, searching for something, and it turns out you're actually looking for a someone named Jesus. And you won't find your answer in your bank account. You won't find it in a romantic relationship. You won't find it in your career or in religion or at the bottom of a bottle. Jesus is standing before you today asking the question that he asks all of us today. Do you want to get well? What do you want me to do for you? What do you want? Only he can do that. And only you can decide how you're going to respond to that invitation. Wake up today. Because if you don't, Jesus warned that if we don't wake up, something far worse will happen to us than anything that can happen on this earth. Life separated from the one who gives us life. And that is no life at all. Instead, follow where your desires are leading you because they are pointing you ultimately to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you that all of our desires, our deepest desires, even our most surface desires, ultimately point toward you, ultimately find their fulfillment in you. This is why constantly in the scriptures talk of hunger and thirst and all of these desires we have are ultimately used as spiritual metaphors to refer to our deepest yearnings and desires which only find their fulfillment in you. And so, Father, I pray that we would not ignore our desires, but we would listen to them. We would realize what they're actually pointing to because they are pointing to you. They are pointing to your son, Jesus. And it has turned out that you have actually been working in our lives this entire time. And so we can surrender ourselves to you in faith, trust in your death on the cross to forgive us of our sins, and find life eternal with you forever in heaven. That is our deepest desire, and that is where the fulfillment will be found. And we thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name.